Jesus Christ believes he has a fatal illness. Everybody has it. This illness is growing old for you. I'm good. What is your epigenetic age, please? So my epigenetic age is about 33. But I'm 51. <laughs> oh God, isn't she? She's 51 years old? I'm glad you actually know about <laughs> epigenetics. That actually surprises me. I'm so surprised. I, I, I want to know the key to determine that time. Well, we're working on that, and that's what we're going to talk about. The stage is yours. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you for having me here. My company is BioVita, and we're committed to curing aging through gene therapy. When we talk about gene therapy uh, and treating aging, it's really important to be very clear about what we are saying. We don't want to cure your chronological aging, so it's important that you get older by years, meaning we want you to take many trips around the sun, but we want to treat your biological aging because your age is your biggest risk factor for death. Did you know that? The older you are, the more likely you are to die, but it's not because what you think. You think that maybe you've been here too long. It's actually a cellular process of cellular degeneration. So we're going to look at a graph here. Can you see this presentation? Oh yeah, here we go. And if you look at the top here, there's a difference between lifespan and health span. So people are living longer than ever, but they're not living well. It's estimated today that we will spend 30% of our lifespan in ill health. And actually we can't afford that. Governments can't afford it. Families can't afford it, and it's actually quite awful. If we look at the bottom graph here, this is this is the death curve. This is how people die and when people die. So aging-associated non-communicable diseases are now the top killers on the whole planet. They kill the most people. 63% of the total global population will die of biological aging. Today, 100,000 people will die. This, this year alone, 41 million people of potentially treatable diseases. We should not be leaving our children with these diseases. Historically, science has always stepped forward to help us live longer and better. The innovation of penicillin has saved millions and millions of lives. And now regenerative medicine will step in and save yours. On the bottom here, this is again the population curve. This is when we die. We start to really increasingly die at the age of 70. But this here, this line up here is called squaring the curve and that's our job as a company. We are trying to square the curve of longevity, meaning to help you live as long as possible, as healthy as possible, until you hit the bottleneck of aging. Now, there's no one on the planet that's lived over 125 years as far as science is concerned, and so we stop this bottleneck at about 120. But if you're healthy, what will you die of? We actually don't know. So could you potentially go on longer? It's possible. Today we're going to talk about gene therapy. I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. Gene therapy is the insertion or the deletion of genetic material in your cells. Gene therapy gives us the ability to insert therapeutic genes that then code for a protein that then change you. So you might have heard of CRISPR recently. CRISPR is also gene therapy. What we do though at our company is traditional gene therapy in which we use a vector to deliver a gene that codes for a protein that makes you healthier. So somebody must go first, right? Gene therapies now have five regulated cures throughout the world. There's lipoprotein lipase deficiency, spinal muscular atrophy, forms of rare congenital blindness, and severe combined immune deficiency. And in the pipeline today is hemophilia A, hemophilia B, sickle cell anemia, and more. Go and read about it. These are real treatments that are going to get people off of pills for the rest of their life. But when we go first with treating biological aging, it's more complicated. 
So biological aging is what's called a complex disease. It's not one gene. We really wish it was because then we could just deliver that gene and be done. In 2015, I went first. It was really a call out because my son was diagnosed two years before with type 1 diabetes. And I saw what suffering and disease really was. And so I went looking for a cure for kids and I found aging uh, associated diseases and how we can use this platform to help very old people become younger, live healthier, and in turn more quickly cure childhood disease. This year, a paper came out about my results, as it had been seven years uh, since my treatment. And here is specifically my telomere results. So we used two different genes. One of them was called telomerase reverse transcriptase. It lengthens the caps at the ends of your chromosomes. It's important because when your telomeres get short, you're diagnosed with your end stage disease across the board. Many mammalian species have actually, their lifespan are completely limited to their telomere length and how fast it shortens. Dogs, their telomeres shorten about 10 times faster than ours, and we see that in their lifespan. My telomere length, when I first, before I took my first therapy, I was only in the 30th percentile. My telomere average length was the length of a 60 year old person which is actually pretty old for my age then i was 44 at the time since taking two therapies it's now almost the 90th percentile and so by my telomere age i am younger than i was before but when we look at curing aging we're looking at the hallmarks of aging okay there was a paper that came out in 2013 that described the hallmarks of aging giving scientists something to shoot for a way to actually treat biological aging. Telomeres is just one of those. So my telomeres are very young, but not all of my biology is. And that's one of the problems that we're trying to solve. So dementia is the loss of memory. So a lot of people said, well, you took this gene therapy in 2015, but what about the rest of the world? Well, in 2020, we um, teamed up with a medical tourism company and people went offshore for a dementia trial. This is pretty cool because this is technology they couldn't utilize. The treatments were all paid for, everyone was brought in. Actually, um, some quite amazing scientists came down to participate. And what we found by delivering telomerase reverse transcriptase and a gene called cognitive ability is that we might actually be able to treat dementia. A little bit sticky button. So we, uh, we're missing slides, sorry. So what we saw is we saw improved cognition in the Folstein test scores, which is quite amazing because there is no other treatment for dementia that does that, not one. Uh, the patient scores increased and oddly enough, their telomeres got longer, which it was a very small amount. It was delivered intranasally, and we weren't expecting to see that. So those were two unexpected uh, outcomes. But then we, as a company, decided that we wanted to do better than that. We just don't want to uh, deliver genes that will treat one hallmark of aging or two hallmarks of aging. We want to be able to deliver the, the combinatorial gene therapy that will actually cure aging. And remember, there's nine hallmarks of aging. So we went back to research, and uh, this paper just came out from three years of research that we did. And this is from the Proceedings of the National uh, Academy of Sciences, so it's a very top journal. We delivered to mice two forms of uh, gene therapy, telomerase reverse transcriptase and folistatin. And we really were testing the gene therapy delivery method. So when you're delivering gene therapy, you're delivering two different things. One is the gene therapy delivery, and the other one is the genes of interest. So we chose two genes that we already know what they do. Telomerase reverse transcriptase should lengthen the caps at the ends of the chromosomes, and folostatin should increase their muscle mass. These are our star ladies. So on the bottom left, you'll see the untreated mice. Uh, these are mice that are 24 months old, and they didn't live too much longer than that. These are wild-type mice, so it's a very valid experiment. 
On the top right, you see the mice with statin. These ladies are palmed up. The mass that you see on them, they're 33% heavier with just muscle. Okay, I took that gene therapy in 2015, love it. Uh, they are stronger, and the reason that we would do that is because frailty kills. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass over time. And so this, must, this was already known to work in mice, and here it is working. On the bottom right, we see the telomerase reverse transcriptase therapy. And what's crazy about this is, I don't know if you noticed, they're super young looking. The vet techs thought that those were eight month old mice. They couldn't get over it. And these mice are all the same age. So what we saw was uh, mitochondrial benefits. So if you look at the far uh, right column, the folostatin, and the penultimate column, that's telomerase reverse transcriptase and folostatin working in the cells. The column on the far left is uh, an eight-month-old mouse. So they had better mitochondrial function, and that probably had to do with why they lived longer and healthier, because that's almost also a hallmark of aging. We're missing a slide, that's okay. So what does this mean for you? Uh, that's the most important thing, right? You're watching, you're saying, okay, lady, you took some gene therapy. These people took some gene therapy. These mice took some gene therapy. Well, this is how this would translate, this research alone. So the untreated mice all died before they were 30 months old. Okay, across the board, every one of them was dead before the treated mice started to pass on. If they were the average age of, let's say, an 80-year-old human, if your family lives to about 80 years old, taking folostatin alone would mean that you would live almost 100 years. Now, that's if it translates completely. If you took telomerase reverse transcriptase, you might live to be a super centenarian, meaning over 110 years. And the most important thing here is what you're seeing up here. It's the health span. That's what we're shooting for. The last slide was a paper that we came out with two days ago. It's called the Best Choice Medicine Plan for Healthy uh, Longevity and Aging Associated Diseases. It's a call out, uh, here we go, to the governments to actually help people get access to these technologies right in your own country. That's really important because we don't want to cure more mice of aging. It's important that we translate this to your parents and to your grandparents. So the future of healthcare, what does it look like? It looks like abundance. It looks like proactive healthcare instead of precautionary reactive healthcare. Today's sick care system is something that we can't afford. Did you know if we just delayed aging by one year, one year, it would save the global economy $38 trillion. That's not what the companies would make. That's how much it would save the global economy. That's out in a peer-reviewed paper by David Sinclair. And this woman on the left, in the future, she's like 120. <laughs> and she's outrunning her 20-year-old boyfriend, by the way. <laughs> so the future looks awesome. I want to thank our team. Uh, these people are amazing, Rutgers University and our own company, and our scientific advisors like George Church, who is the professor of genetics at Harvard. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for that beautiful presentation, Liz. And I have a question for you, actually two questions. Uh, do you think that aging is a disease, if it can be considered a disease? And number two, if it is a disease, do you think it is a curable disease? Yes and yes. Uh, aging actually is, the, the processes that are happening at the cellular level are what are killing us. Things like dementia and heart disease and cancer are literally symptoms of an aging cell. So by targeting the aging cell, we will be able to eradicate those diseases at one time. And what's really important about your questions is a lot of people say, why can't we just cure cancer and everyone would be happy? Because it's the aging cell. If you cured cancer, look it up. On average, people would only live two to four years longer. That's it, that's all you get. Because you die of heart disease, you die of dementia or kidney failure and COPD. 
you have to treat aging or else there's no cure. Where can we find out more about this? Is there any conference, any big uh, international meeting uh, where we can find out about this, please? Well, yeah, there's two things you can do. You can look at Jose Cordero's book. It's called The Death of Death. It's a bestseller actually in Spain and all over the world. And number two, you can join us at RadFest. Um, I'm inviting you. It's in California. It's the biggest conference on aging. We get the top scientists and the top speakers around the world. This is a huge market for business. Several businesses are going into this space and it's the biggest bang for the buck in healthcare. So please come learn about it. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, in talking about aesthetics, aesthetics medicine, how, what's your opinion, your approach with these uh, therapies in this field? As far as aesthetic aesthetics go? Are you, you meaning appearance? What aesthetics medicine? Yeah, so this, this is really going to be the revolutionary game changer in appearance. So anyone who's following the space of gene therapy and regenerative medicine, you'll see that 80 year old cells now have been turned back to be between the ages of 20 and 30. It's called partial cell reprogramming. So it's kind of uh, an area that is um, pretty unlimited. And you are going to see, again, people looking younger, living longer and healthier. And so if we don't change the way you look, your appearance, then you're still dying of aging because your skin is your biggest organ. So this is a big target of these type of therapies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presence. And it's quite inspiring your job and development. Um, regarding the organon chip developments and the use of microfluidics and semiconductors, uh, do you think that these kind of models, in vivo models, will be affected by the developments of these organon chip systems? And do you think that they will change the use of animal models? Thank you very much. Oh wow, that's a lot of questions. So I have an MBA. Uh, most of the science is obviously all of the science is done by our scientific team. Our the professor of genetics from Harvard is our number one scientific advisor who oversees our science. Um, these people are super highly qualified. As far as gene therapy, gene therapy, we're able to get it into human cells. Uh, we're building bigger and better gene therapies, like the one I was talking about, the CMV and the paper PNAS, in order to get more therapeutic payload into each gene therapy, creating precision medicine. Um, we still have a limit. We can't get gene therapy to every cell in the body with one treatment, but that's okay. Often we're using genes that are actually shared in your blood. So you would only maybe need to get an injection in your muscles to affect your whole organism. When we have a limit like telomerase reverse transcriptase where we're trying to get it into every cell in the body, that is a little bit more problematic for the gene therapy space and that's one of the problems that we're trying to solve. Probably with a gene therapy like that, you'll need to take it every five years or so. But if you can imagine, throwing all of the pills and the things that you take off of your countertop for an occasional injection, we think that people will want to do that. Okay, thank you, I'm over time.